Most of the time when we hear the lessons that are assigned for Sunday, we roll through them giving no thought at all to where they came from and how it is decided which lessons we will hear. Most of you know we have a lectionary which is based on a three-year cycle that gets us through about 85% of scripture and, and worship over that three-year period. But none of us give much thought to the group of people who actually compiled this lectionary. But I think today's gospel lesson actually pulls back the veil a little bit, at least the way it's put together, pulls back the veil and we can almost see those people sitting around the table trying to decide which verses of chapter 15 we should hear today. Surely they're trying to work their way around this really difficult story about Jesus. Surely they were saying, we can't just let the story of his encounter with the Canaanite woman stand by itself. Because if we do, well, we've got to really mean Jesus. So we've got to do something to soften this a little bit. Maybe we could put something on at the end, you know, something in 16th chapter, or back it up into the 15th. And so they add this parenthetical interpretation of an argument that Jesus had before that, that on its first blush doesn't look like it has anything to do with what comes next. And we find ourselves feeling a little chagrin, almost like a miner trying to buy beer, throwing all the unrelated things on the counter, hoping that the clerk doesn't see the Shiner Bach right in the middle. No, we have to wrestle with this gospel lesson because it sure does appear that Jesus is mean. But the compilers of the lectionary are not wrong because it's always true that putting a lesson in context is better and helpful. And so that's what they started to do. They put it in context, but to really get it in context, we have to back it up even further. And that would have made for a very, very long gospel lesson. But what, if we do, if we back it up to the beginning of the 15th chapter, we discover that we see again this pattern that we have discussed before of how Jesus has a confrontation with the religious authorities. And then he teaches, and then he acts out what he's just taught. So if we remember that, when we back it up to the beginning of the 15th chapter, we see Jesus in a confrontation with the Pharisees. And they confront him that he and his disciples are not observing the Hebrew law in the way it was written. Now, it is very important for us today not to make a cartoon out of this conversation because these are not the proverbial school marm whacking the knuckles of disobedient children. These are actually the keepers of an ancient law that has been learned and tested and tried over millennia that help prevent defilement. These are actually hygiene laws, both physical hygiene and spiritual hygiene. The law is designed to keep people safe. And they realized that the washing of hands in pots in a ritual way helped keep people healthy. And so it became a law. Much like their obedience to how they pray to God and how they live their lives, some behaviors put them in the grace and presence of God and others put them at odds with God. So it's important to understand that these people had a really important job and they were caring about the well-being of God's people. So when they confront the disciples about their behavior, we can assume it is because they are doing their job. Jesus takes this opportunity, though, to not really speak at all to the, the validity of those rules, but to speak to something that is different, to speak to this human reality that happens almost all the time to us. And it is that where we become obsessed with the letter of the law and not its deep purpose. So he, they point out that they're not obeying the washing rituals. And he points out to them that you use the law for the very opposite reason for which it was designed. You yourselves take the law and then neglect the people that should be cared for the most by being ritually pure. And then he begins to teach, and this is where we pick up with what's in the lectionary today. He begins to teach and he says that it's not the things that come into a person that actually defile. These are not the things that you really need to be worried about. It's actually the things that come out of the human heart that defile. That is the source 
of the real pain and suffering in this world. All of the malice and the evil intention and the murder and the strife and the slander and the fornication and on and on the list goes. Now, Jesus and his friends go for a walk. And here comes the walking, talking example of the things that defile. All of the things that are on the outside that people should be afraid of. She is the walking, talking example of this. First, she's a Canaanite. Hebrew people have been in battles with the Canaanites since they first got to the promised land. So they have been, and it has cost life and limb and property for both groups. So there's great animosity between these people. First, that's the outside. Danger, danger. Then, in her culture at that time, she is a woman not related to Jesus, shouting loudly, trying to get something from him. She doesn't even know him. Also, danger. And then finally, her daughter is possessed by the de a demon. Final danger. Danger, danger, danger. Jesus ignores her first. She cries out, Lord, have mercy. My daughter is plagued by a demon. And Jesus ignores her. And the disciples do precisely what the Pharisees want them to do in this point. Stop. You stay away. Get over there. You are dangerous. And then she kneels before Jesus and says, please help me. This is the same cry that Peter cried out to Jesus just days before when he was sinking into the sea. Lord, help me. Help me. And he says something really mean. He says, I've got nothing for you. I am here for the lost sheep of Israel. I'm not here for you, dog. He calls her a dog. He calls a woman a dog. I can't imagine that was any more well-received then than it is now. What a deeply hurtful thing to say. And now she gets the punchline. She says, yes, but even the dogs get to pick up the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus is amazed. Jesus is surprised. I picture him almost stepping back and something is cracked open. It looks like Jesus himself is cracked open. This very same thing that he had been trying to teach the Pharisees about comes true right before his eyes, and maybe, maybe it's even bigger than he thought it was. It applies to her. Have mercy, she says. And Jesus finally yields and says, Great is your faith, your daughter is healed. Now the boundaries are just gone. They were not moved, they were not compromised, they were not negotiated away. They evaporated in the face of mercy. So, you're going to have to deal with me and Jesus yourself. I don't know, finally, what to do with this. Maybe he was just teaching. Maybe it was just an object lesson and he knew all along. Maybe it was with a wink. Maybe he wasn't that mean. Maybe I'm sensitive to the meanness because I'm a psych major and a gentle guy and I was raised on an awful lot of acoustic guitar and kumbaya. But for whatever it is, mercy won the day. Mercy wins the day. I'm thoughtful of all of the boundaries that we put up to keep ourselves safe. And all of the boundaries that we're all obsessed with right this minute during this pandemic. All of the things that we're doing to keep ourselves and those we love safe, to keep one another safe. And how long does it take before all of a sudden we're obsessed with the rules and we forget who's on the other side? In that setting, the only salvation act we have is mercy. It's when we finally cry out, Lord, save me. And we experience God's mercy. And then we share God's mercy with the world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.